Nigel Shadbolt, thank you very much for inviting us here to Jesus College today. You're the principal of Indeed. this college, and many people will know you in Oxford and around Oxford uh, for that. But you're also the chairman and the co-founder of the Open Data Institute. You've got many research interests uh, in artificial intelligence and web science. So there's lots of interests mm. here that are relevant to this broad issue of media and the opportunities as well. Indeed. And if I can just begin then, uh, focusing very broadly on data and privacy and what's happened recently, uh, you gave an interview to the Financial Times in 2013, and right at the end of that interview, you said, personal data, big data, open data, it's time has come. It's as simple as that. But it's not as simple as that, is it? It's as simple as that in the sense that it's on people's minds, right? I mean, the whole question of whose data is it anyway, and what is the tsunami of data doing to us in an age of um, massive availability, huge amounts of potential analysis on that data. You know, what is the balance of power, for example, between the citizen and state, or a consumer and the the large kind of information uh, uh, platforms? What does that look like? That's that's really the uh, the kind of call to action in the, in that article. Also, um, to understand that data isn't one kind of thing. That there is a a spectrum of data types from open and non-personal data, the stuff about when the trains are running and uh, where the hospitals are, people couldn't really argue about that, although surprisingly we've had to work hard to get that data released in a way that uh, is easy for machines to process. So the open data in that sense. Through to shared data where we understand there's an interest in uh, perhaps commercial or government agencies uh, sharing it under some more restrictive uh, licensing arrangement with organizations or individuals through the stuff that is in some sense closed. It may be closed because it has security implications. It may be closed because it's personal and important and relevant to an individual. That spectrum, we call it the data spectrum, is really important to understand because often the conversations are very unnuanced. You know, data is one kind of thing. And of course, actually, it's not really data, it's information. That is to say, these numbers and values are equipped with meaning. We know what they're about. Um, and I think the other thing I'd say is that actually I'm also a professor of computer science here in Oxford is that the extraordinary explosion in power, computing power, and algorithmic power to process this stuff, that it's t its time has always been coming, but it's particularly prescient now, of course, with all of the uh, issues around uh, uh, analysis of personal data. Yeah. Mm, and as you say, all the different relationships between consumers and businesses Indeed. Yeah. and recent events. Perhaps what underpins that, and as you said, five years ago, which seems mm. so long ago, considering <laughs> what happened, what underpins it uh, really uh, is control yeah. and who controls yeah. that data yeah. and that information. And it's yeah. because it's such a diverse range of information, yeah. um, there needs to be arguably some sort of regulation or control. Well, that and, that, and that of course is the question here, is, is how we can keep our social norms, our laws, our regulation, our oversight in, 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 in sync with these very rapid developments. A, a book that uh, I co-authored with a colleague, Kieran O'Hara, um, even earlier than 2013, was, uh, was The Spy in the Coffee Machine, which imagined this um, surveillance um, environment that we now live in. And we've talked about surveillance as well, of course, which is the idea that so many devices are capturing information about you, not explicitly to survey you, but they just simply are, that uh, we have, when you stitch all that information together, an extraordinary mosaic, an extraordinary picture of individuals' patterns of lives. And how are we going to think about building social, legal, and um, various other organizational checks and balances into that? And talking about those the departments you've been working with then, are there some uh, areas in society and people you work with that are more um, accepting of working on open data? Is there a priority for some and not for others? Well, I mean, the, o the UK got off to a, um, a cracking start with this, with, with governments uh, that were behind the open data agenda at the highest level, you know, prime ministerial support across um, uh, three governments. Um, and I think the UK still believes it's kind of at uh, the forefront of this work, but other countries see the opportunity. I think a race to the top in this area is quite useful, actually, you know, kind of governments competing on what data they might publish. But no, it's... it's, it's um, it's eternal vigilance, frankly. I mean, it's, it's a constant, our job partly as the ODI is to help and support government, but also to act as a critical friend. And, and in some cases, you know, uh, pointing out that, that more could be and should be done. And we will go into some departments where there's, there's a real appetite for this. Um, 
other departments where there has been and perhaps they need to be uh, reinvigorated uh, or, or, or rededicate themselves because I think this should be a part of doing business. And if I look at the most successful examples of, of open data, uh, it can look very literally pedestrian. Uh, um, the Department of Transport publishes routinely now data. Uh, in fact, Transport for London has real-time access to the real-time data about where the trains are, where the buses are, where the jams are. And this has revolutionised the apps that get built by third parties to move people around that great city. And this just should be a standard practice. Every Department of State should be saying, What's our API, technical term, application programming interface that allows you to hook up to real-time data feeds to drive services? Met Office, Department of the Environment, Companies House, Transport for London, wherever that might be. And I'm wondering as well, in terms of the internal structure of the ODI then, you know, obviously people know that you and Mr Berners-Lee are involved uh, with this. Do you have different views with each other in terms of how you approach these issues then? Because I can imagine, data, obviously we, I know your views now because you've been telling me them, but I can imagine you know, every particular case that you face, perhaps there's different ways that within the ODI and as well the people you work with, you have different yeah. solutions and you have different discussions and debates. It would be very tedious if we all agreed on everything. Uh, but Tim and I have worked together for a long time and both both on scientific and research programs together and also on the um, if you like the, the politics of this. And so I think we do see the world in, in a very similar way. I mean his great gift to the world was a set of standards and then software uh, uh, core software elements that gave us the World Wide Web. Uh, before that we had a Babel of different kind of documentation interchange and content interchange formats. So that unification, it, it delivered something remarkable. And his ambition was always that that should be accessible, universal, and a canvas on which people could write. He always recognized that such a thing would carry light and shade, you know, that it would reflect human interests. And um, what we've seen, of course, is that that infrastructure can be used to do ill as well as great good. Uh, but I think that's the case with so much of science, technology and engineering. Computing is a dual use technology, just like chemical science got weaponized, biological sciences became weaponized, nuclear classically. So we are always going to be facing the issue of how we deploy our technologies and how we keep them free to allow human ingenuity and innovation to flourish. And that's where Tim and I absolutely uh, agree. And we also recognize what the challenges are. Now, within the ODI, there'll be different views about what we might prioritize, but we're a very value-driven organization. We have a, we're quite mission-driven. We're a, uh, a company limited by guarantee. That means anything that we do do that generates any kind of revenue is put back into the core mission uh, of trying to uh, make data work equitably for everyone. You've also said that you are, and it's clear now that you're very optimistic about the power of good data and talked about how data should be a part of our national infrastructure like power grids mm. and roads. It sounds as if we're on that right track getting there at the minute, especially, especially in Britain. Yeah, I think um, a narrative around data as infrastructure, what does that actually mean? You know, what do you need to be building for the future. Um, what's the equivalent of your clean water supply, if you like? But there are challenges. I mean, clearly, um, you know, I think it's our job to be optimistic, but we've got to be realistic about where the, uh, the problems and challenges lie. And, and clearly, data and um, great computing power can be used to perverse ends or to ends that aren't in everybody's interest. And that is where a lot of the discussion is at the moment. And I think that's a great thing. It's a really important thing that we understand the ethics, understand the implications of what we do, and that we uh, imagine that there are things we can do about it. To simply say, you know, for example, as has been held in the past, privacy is dead, get over it, is a c totally inappropriate response. It's our job to understand how we keep important features of our autonomy and our sense of a private space alive and well. And it doesn't matter that the world might be covered in CCTV cameras. The fact it is, in some sense, being 
capture does not mean it can be used for any particular purpose. And we, 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 we know that in the existing law around privacy, a reasonable expectation to means even if people have collected those photographs, they are not free to publish them or use them in particular ways against an individual. Perhaps uh, another area which is very similar and one of your main research focuses which is AI, artificial mm. intelligence, where people aren't as optimistic as you about that because people have always imagined a Terminator <laughs> scenario and you were on a Guardian mm. podcast recently mm. Mm. talking about this and it perhaps goes back to 1997, um, you know, looking at Gary Kasparov uh, mm. losing his match with the IBM's Deep Blue, uh, marking the first time that mm. humans really perhaps lost to the technology. Mm. There's a lot of discussions that I've had with people on the student radio and generally with people that are involved with technology. And we always hear terms such as AI, and it's sometimes difficult for especially young people to grasp exactly mm. what it encompasses. Because it really, if you Google it, it means you know, smart technology, you know, technology becoming more human to some extent. Well, what's AI to you in, in the modern sense? Well, I, I go back to AI in the classic sense. I, I, uh, I was inspired by films like 2001, which actually features a very mad, bad and dangerous to know computer in some sense, old Hal, you know, he has a bit of a breakdown and then uh, <laughs> tries to take the crew out. So uh, the Hollywood depiction of, uh, of AI is often, uh, uh, you know, um, as I say, uh, lethal robots of various sorts. Often a bit of a twist at the end where the, there's some redemptive kind of element to the, uh, to the machine as it acquires uh, uh, human characteristics. But uh, fundamentally, AI, and, and I began my studies in, in, in 1978 in AI, so it's a very long time ago, and, and, but all of that time, we've seen a moving tide where uh, the developments, particularly in electrical engineering, have given this computing power that keeps doubling in capability every 15 months or so. So that's hugely transformative. And what it also means is that today's AI is tomorrow's computer science in a certain sense. So what is it? Well, actually, in one instrumental sense, it's a set of methods and techniques, quite a big toolkit now of methods for doing advanced information processing. Um, but what is it? Is it what's the ambition around understanding human mentality or indeed building a self-aware machine? My interest was at partly using computers to understand uh, human intelligent behavior. And they do, they help us in lots of ways, but we haven't built human level intelligence generally. What we have built are these narrow task achieving superhuman machines for chess now and also Go. And they can do a great job on recognizing lots and lots of people's faces, but they don't learn in the same way a human learns and the amount of information they're exposed to is entirely different and the different methods. Yeah, so what is AI? It's a, gr it's a broad range of methods, some of which become unremarkable very quickly. And for people often, the moving target is, have we built that self-aware genius robot yet? That is a very long way away, despite what you might hear from some of the hyperbole around AI. Uh, but that won't stop pervasive AI featuring every device. And it won't stop you imagining that perhaps there is something more substantial behind the chat bot than you might have thought. So, you know, whether it's Alexa in your home or Siri on your phone, increasingly that will assume a sense of, of personality where you feel it is very attentive and aware of what you want. I can assure you it isn't. <laughs> it's simply uh, software that is agile in responding to your actual own behavior. And we've got a very large set of these methods. Much of it owes to success in statistics and mathematics and engineering. And uh, as we build our autonomous self-driving cars or as we build um, instantaneous uh, human language translation systems, that does not mean we have understood the general tenets of human self-aware intelligence. Globally, globally then as well, uh, we've got a lot of debate and there is some sort of race with AI as well. Uh, recently there's obviously talk yeah. about a European, a European yeah. AI hub. 
are Europeans leading the way with this? Is, is there any sort of shift in the power structures and who's getting there and standing robot technology? And there have always been centres that have kind of uh, had a strong uh, research presence in this area. Uh, historically, the UK has been well positioned, but so have uh, large, large and significant centres in the US, Stanford, MIT, uh, uh, Carnegie Mellon, these kinds of institutions. What we do see is uh, increasing uh, amounts of interest from around, uh, around the world, particularly um, uh, China and the Far East, Singapore, other, other jurisdictions. European AI has always been very healthy, you know, from France to Germany to, uh, uh, to countries uh, across the uh, European um, Union. So I can well imagine that a focus there would, would make sense. Um, just in the same way we've got centers of excellence in, 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 in nuclear or in uh, physics or in biology. Um, and I just think that we should be, I'm optimistic, but I understand where the dangers are. The dangers are in our own governance, in our own sense of what we use the technology for. The danger is not in the machines waking up and deciding to put away of it with us. Um, but the dangers are how we use the technology. Uh, and there are plenty of worrying signs when people talk about sovereign AI capability and whoever wins the race in AI will be the next superpower. Um, nations have to understand what their obligations are here and what they're trying to use it for. We should be in a dialogue internationally about this in just the way we have with other weaponization of science. People talk about a digital D Geneva Convention. They talk about this partly because it's not just the AI. On a day-to-day -day basis, there is undeclared um, war between nation states attacking each other's cyber infrastructure, you know, probing it, testing it out, uh, denial of service attacks from here and there and everywhere. This is just not a way to behave. Um, and eventually we have to become mature enough to say um, these are not the kinds of activities that mature states undertake on each other. We wouldn't tolerate it in physical space. Why do we tolerate it in cyberspace? But if there isn't any maturity in some of the political centres and all these countries worldwide, yeah, perhaps, yeah. Mm. Uh, it, some may ask the question or would say that the regulatory environment for technology comes with those who control it. So that's perhaps one of the biggest things. It's a challenge, and it's a challenge, and the whole issue about how you affect control in this area. Uh, but, you know, it, didn't, it hasn't eluded us in the past when we've looked at other areas and said, you know, how do we, how do we provide limitations on ourselves uh, and, and to simply say, well, there are bad actors out there, uh, inevitably we all have. And of course, in some sense, a natural response for any organized nation is to develop its own capability, both offensively and defensively. So, but I, I think this is something we're going to see a lot of concern and discussion around. Um, but in the same way that we can also we should also say that it's not just the AI here. It's our general ability across the digital space to deny each other or to uh, support each other's capabilities that's at stake. And uh, I think countries do understand the importance, the pervasive importance of these uh, digital networks now. And if we were to bring the whole systems crashing down, our dependence, our exquisite interdependence would be made very clear. And I think that's where people have also uh, self-interest. And before we finish then, um, obviously you're now, well, your book's coming out um, in a couple of weeks. Time. Oh, the book. <laughs> yeah, the, book um, the autobiography. No, um, tell us a bit more about this book. Then. Well, the book, yeah, the book's called The Digital Ape. Uh, parenthetically, uh, how to live in peace with smart machines. So it's on many of the themes we've talked about today, actually, coincidentally. But it, it's, it's, it's having written plenty of scientific and uh, engineering papers, as you do as an academic, a popular book, an accessible book on, on these sorts of issues. And it's partly uh, pays an homage in the title to Desmond Morris's great book, The Naked Ape, which was a, a zoologist's reflection on the human condition. And this is a kind of a computer scientist's reflection on the human condition in the 21st century and trying to understand how we live in peace with our new technology, with our new digital companions, with a whole set of issues that should augment us and not oppress us. Finally as well, uh, you've talked about how you were inspired by the space missions of the 60s and mm. 70s and uh, beyond. 
and the astronauts and you've got some memorabilia from space <laughs> uh, from this article <laughs> I read. So what I thought I'd ask you just to finish, where do people my age find that inspiration now? Because the space missions are still happening, perhaps not as frequent as before. Um, it's been happening for decades. There's not perhaps as much excitement generally. We got used to it. Does it come from people such as Mark Zuckerberg, Elon Musk, is it, or books such as yours to inspire people the next generation? Where do they look for that inspiration? Well, I think there's a lot of inspiration to be had. Uh, I think space is still a very inspiring area, whether it's man travel or just observational astronomy. I mean, the, f the extraordinary to me. I mean, those those space missions. You know, look what's happened since then. You know, we, we're busy imaging thousands of exoplanets that are planets revolving around stars light years away from here and we've just launched a new uh, mission that's going to do that even better. You know, uh, remarkable that we should be able to, in a certain sense, see the world in that way. So there's a great piece of science to be inspired by and just as much there's a great science that ins should inspire people around modern neuroscience, trying to decode and understand the fundamental uh, mysteries of, of, of human uh, cognition and, and intelligence, and indeed w more widely than that. So I think there's no lack of science, uh, engineering, life science to be impressed by. There's no lack of work in creative industries and humanity. If you see now the amount of work that's just done off the back of our extraordinary uh, computing um, technology to generate material and content for us. Th these are things we should be excited and inspired by. I don't think it's individuals. You will lock on particular things people do, but I think the questions are the things that always fundamentally inspired me. The questions that inspired me revolved around the intelligence. You know, How were we intelligent? Could we build machines that reflected aspects of intelligence? And is there any intelligence out there? So that's my inspiration. So Nigel, thank you very much. Thank you.